welcome to the event. The event's called Bitcoin Urbanism, and this is really special. Like, this is a world's first, first, the first live event on the topic of Bitcoin Urbanism. We're going to talk about how the Bitcoin standard will change the way we build, and we have some incredible speakers tonight. I'm so excited. Um, and and the goal is to like, I mean, this this word has, you know, done the rounds here and there. Uh, but the goal is to really talk about it like something that's not just kind of a fashionable new terminology or something, but but to talk about um, this this evolution that I believe is bound to happen, uh, in which Bitcoiners will leave um, um, a very significant mark on this world and something that's going to reverberate for generations to come in the physical form in the built environment. And so in, in my little presentation, I want to make a, make a case for how that's physically possible, like how we can even pull that off, and then also like how that potentially is going to look like. What kind of, how are these values of ours going to translate into the, uh, the built environment? So let's get going. So uh, bull by the horns, I believe the next 50 years are going to be an era of Bitcoin construction. And uh, I'm going to try and make that case right here. So for the next 50 years, Bitcoiners are going to build a lot of buildings. First of all, demographically speaking, you know, hodlers, Bitcoiners are currently between age 25 and 45, like roughly speaking. And if you, if you look at just kind of what we all see around us and also all the, the surveys that have been done. And then if you look at how, you know, what kind of people build custom built homes, those people tend to be between 45 and 65. So basically the oldest Bitcoiners, and I know I don't want to disrespect Bitcoiners who are older than you know, uh, 45, but, but I'm just kind of talking about a big cohort. There's going to be a big cohort that is actually thinking about building a home right now. And so that's, um, that's one driver, I believe, or just people are going to think about, I want a home for my family. But I think there's a lot more to this Bitcoin urbanism thing than just this. Let's talk about price. We all love moon math, don't we? <clears throat> uh, <laughs> no, Bitcoin has, has risen by 1,000% on average every two years since inception, more or less. Right? And of course, you know, there are cycles that are slower, there are cycles that are faster, um, but we are on this ascent of, of global Bitcoin adoption, adoption of the Bitcoin standard, and we are starting to become a part um, of let's call it the financial elites of the world. Like this is actually starting to happen, right? Um, and, and the reason why I want to talk about this is not because I want to talk about power or anything like that, but more like if you think about like who, who are the people that in the private sphere build the buildings that we all know and remember, like this Littlefield building. Um, it's generally the people of means, and that means like people that ha have substantial wealth. So if you look on a global scale, um, People that own more than $50 million is about 250,000 people around the world right now uh, own more than $50 million. Well, if you think about the, you know, Bitcoiners that have that amount of wealth in Bitcoin, um, it's already 2,500 today. So basically, we are already 1% of the financial elites, if you will. And then if we imagine Bitcoin you know, going up to a million dollars per coin, well, then all of a sudden we have 25,000 people who own, you know, who have Bitcoin wealth of more than $50 million worth. And so then we're 10% of the global elites. And so I believe that gradually over the next few decades, we're going to start becoming more and more part of and representing of um, 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 a group of people that can actually leave a mark, culturally speaking, in this world in a, in a physical way. So basically, hodlers, yes, I believe we could grow to about 50% of global financial elites. And in addition to that, it's not enough to say like, oh, but we will have money because, yeah, we, we just invented the best money in the world. So, yes, we will have money. Um, <laughs> but also there, there needs to be a desire to actually leave behind something, to do something different, um, leave a, a legacy behind. And I believe that's, that's totally here. I'll talk about it for a moment more, but but if you look at the research about when people start thinking about leaving a, a legacy in the material sense, like once they've taken care of their families and uh, once once they had a uh, fulfilling career, they tend to be uh, age sixty to seventy is kind of when people start charitable giving, and and that includes you know giving to the university, who's going to then build a new building, or you know financing the church's new project and those kind of things. So that's another. 
a demographic wave that I believe is coming. So oldest Bitcoiners, the big cohort is 45. So give it another 15 years and we'll, we'll see a lot of people be very interested in this kind of thing. And so, like I said, like we are different. Like we're, we talk about f the fiat monetary system. We don't like it. We talk about it with kind of disdain. Um, we start talking about other things that are associated with fiat culture. Like we talk about fiat food. We talk about, you know, uh, fiat bureaucracy, like all, all kinds of things. And so it's my belief that we'll also start talking about fiat architecture, like the architecture that's particularly associated with the 20th century. I believe there's going to be a substantial kind of a counter movement. We'll, we'll start leaning the other way. And so... Um, and, and so I think, and, and because we want to leave a distinct mark, like we want to tell the future, the future generations that we were here and we did something important and it mattered. So in summary, I believe the first building boom is going to have two components. There's going to be a vernacular component, which means, you know, everyday homes, people building their own homes uh, in, in, a, in a, a, a private context. And that's going to look in a, a particular way over time. And then in a, a later stage, we'll also start seeing people contribute to public buildings like monuments and libraries and, and, and concert halls and those kind of things. And those things are going to come together in certain places. And I believe that is what people will point at in the future and be like, look, that's Bitcoin urbanism right there. So, so let's talk a little bit about the cypherpunk values, the values that we have just by being in the Bitcoin space. Um, and, and, and talking about this thing and thinking about it every day, um, you know, what are some of these values and, and how might they translate into architecture? So a book that's helped me a great deal in thinking about these things, and it's actually on the table in the back if you want to have a look, is a book by Stuart Brandt. He was a, a, he's still alive, but he was um, a, a known intellectual and activist and an entrepreneur in the 60s, and he, he uh, published the Whole Earth Catalog. You might, you might remember that. So he has this great book in which he uh, looks at buildings not just as like, oh, it's a project and it's something that's being built and that's it, but he looks at them from a time point of view, like how do buildings evolve after they've been built? And that reveals a lot about their nature, about whether they're quality buildings or whether they're uh, lo low standard buildings. So I'll, I'll grab some concepts from, uh, from Stuart Brand. So first of all, a first you know, kind of principle that I think Bitcoiners are going to lean into is that we'll want to build durably. Like the Bitcoin blockchain is built to last 500 years and longer. Like it's, it's meant to last forever. It's a new ecosystem. Like people talk about Bitcoin like it's, it's an organism. We, we obviously want it to live uh, the longest. And so I believe that's going to translate into how we think about buildings. So like if we leave you know, a legacy in stone, we're going to want something that actually stands the test of time. And uh, we see it in the white paper, you know, he, Satoshi says the network is robust in its unstructured simplicity. We have people like Max Kaiser comparing the robustness of the Internet with the robustness of Bitcoin. Um, and then, of course, uh, Safety Dynamics and the Bitcoin standard talking about low time preference, talking about delaying your, your uh, gratification. And, you know, th that kind of attitude makes it possible to, to think about longevity, to think about long term projects. And of course, you know, the longer we wait to spend our Bitcoin because of natural deflation and adoption, the more it's worth. So we're not in a hurry. So that means we can really start thinking about long term projects that might m might be financed over a period of 100 years or longer. Right. That's totally within reach for people who love and steward this, this hard money of ours. Something uh, I want to grab. And this is the last point about durability from from Stuart Brand's book. Is, um, is on the left here, he talks about that time aspect in, in buildings. And so it's basically a cost breakdown. Like how do the costs that are associated with a particular building, how do those look when you map them out over time? And so you see a big blob in the beginning there. Well, that's just the cost of the, building the house. And then you see more and more costs are added over a period of 50 years. And actually he notices like over a period of 50 years, you spend three times uh, two times more just repairing and maintaining the building than you initially you know spent building it and so if we are interested in longevity we're very interested in reducing that long-term maintenance cost right because that's what allows you know buildings in the uk to stand for 400 years which is a little maintenance and to weather a depression and and still be structurally fine 
So then on the right is all these, the layers that Stuart Brand identifies in buildings. The main one, if you're interested in longevity, is just a structural layer. You want to work with quality materials and uh, in, in a very smart way so that it'll last for a long time. And that's, of course, a lot of what's wrong with the current, you know, f fiat architecture, if you will, fiat building, is that these layers are so thin and they, they interact with each other very quickly once the building is, is exposed to uh, uh, small amounts of stress. Secondly, I believe Bitcoiners, I believe we will build usefully. We're going to be focused on utility. Um, you know, the, the Bitcoin as a project is, is meant to serve a social function. Um, if you think about the, the, the most important contributions of core developers, very often it's about saving a little bit of memory, right? Or trying to like shave off just a little bit of, you know, uh, increasing that efficiency just a little bit, like a one, one byte less per transaction, those kind of things. Uh, so, so very, very focused on, on, on utility and efficiency. And of course, Bitcoin mining, right? I mean, the, the most competitive industry on the planet where everybody competes with everyone every 10 minutes um, you know, every watt and kilowatt matters, right? So, so this is in our DNA, that, that, that focus on utility. And so within that, I just want to kind of highlight this idea of modular design, to, to design something in a modular way. And uh, I'm drawing here from a, a book by Eric Raymond, and he's, um, he's a known Unix developer, and he, he wrote uh, uh, materials that developers go back to over and over because they they find so much value in his ideas about a software design um, and software architecture. And so what he points out is that it's so important that what you build is consist consists out of simple parts that are connected by well-defined interfaces so that most problems are local, right? Because you don't want the second layer, any problem with that to bleed into the first layer and destroy the structure that you were building in the first place. So modularity is very important, and it also totally translates to architecture. Absolutely, right? And this is um, actually a photo I, I pulled from a, uh, Brand's book, where um, he's he's uh, reflecting on this this wave of um, um, geodesic domes that was popular in the '60s. Um, Buckminster Fuller was a big fan of that for all kinds of reasons. And so, but once you zoom out and think about it from a temporal point of view, it's like what happens once the, the person who built this, they were probably super happy with this and they loved it and the sun was just the right angle and everything. Uh, but then, you know, what about it's for sale? And then, okay, well, what if the new buyer, they want to add a garage? Like, how do you do that with a house like this? Or what if you want an attic or, or a barn or something like that? It's, it's completely impractical. So this is the opposite of... Um, modularity and that's that's a big sin that you see uh with a lot of modern architecture is that is that you know they kind of go away from these these known principles that that really work and uh, and then make the house less functional as a result and so the the counter example that Stuart Brand gives in the book is this simple little house built on Cape Cod in 1890 and uh, and you you can see it over time if you take snapshots is that gradually the house changes like people add something they subtract something and that's what what keeps it alive that's how it's more like an organism than than a kind of a dead object and finally that's so so far we've had um, longevity durability we've had utility I think the final principle that we're going to lean into is beauty, is that we're going to build beautifully. And I don't mean that just because, you know, it stirs the heart, it makes you passionate, which is totally valid, but there's also a practical reason why you want to build beautifully if you, if you have those previous uh, values in mind, is that it actually uh, helps preserve things. Like, beauty is like a vessel that can carry things into the future. Like, there, there's beautifully illustrated books that we preserve and cherish, and as a result, the, their content is also preserved for next generations. This is actually a, a technology writer, so he, he writes about, you know, beauty in, in software design and those kind of things, that it's actually very important to focus on that as well. And so, this is the last value that I think hodlers, bitcoiners, cypherpunks are going to more and more feel drawn to because it makes so much sense. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's pleasant, it makes you happy, but also there is that like temporal component to, uh, to beauty. And so <laughs> what, I've d what I've sneakily done is basically introduce the Vitruvian triad to you guys, these, these three values. So Vitruvius is the, the most famous Roman architect from the Roman Empire. He's the only one from which we still have a book preserved. 
And uh, we all know the, you know, Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian man, like that refers to Vitruvius. Um, and so the three values are firmitas, are just, you know, that durability, utilitas, which is um, usefulness, and then venustas is, is beauty. Those are the main principles that he leans on, and those are actually the principles of traditional architecture. So that's kind of the big word that I'm dropping here, where I think that's where we're heading towards, is that um, Bitcoin urbanism is going to lean towards traditional architecture a lot more than, than uh, the, the, the more recent architectural traditions will. Um, I'm going to end with this little modified cartoon. This is a cartoon by Leon Creer. He didn't mean to talk about Bitcoin. Like He, he was trying to highlight this tension that exists between are you going to go for the money or are you going to go for like leaving a legacy and those kind of things. And he was right to point out that there is a tension but that's in the fiat world. In the fiat world, there really is a tension between that short-term, like kind of like Adderall-fueled money that is just available right now, and we've got to spend it and then flip the house, and you know that casino mentality, and then of course the the, the lasting legacies and stone that you see in, in in beautiful cities on the East Coast and in Europe. Uh, but I believe Bitcoin actually harmonizes the two. I believe that if you're a Bitcoin hodler, you 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 make possible these kind of long-term projects. And that's to me, is just so exciting. And that's why I think it's important to talk about Bitcoin urbanism. Thanks. Good.